every song is a snapshot of where you are as a band or as a person, as a lyric writer. But then the same song can take on a whole different meaning. I remember one day we were at Tobin's house and I remember hearing him play the riff on piano. I knew something was there from the first time I heard it. Dave and I just looked at each other like, holy shit, dude. At this point, you know, as a songwriter and as a lyricist, I'm really trying to dig in to the dark corners of my life. I was like, cut my life into pieces. What does that mean? Cut my life into pieces. This is my last resort. We went from being unknowns to being known by the entire world. Cause I'm losing my sight, losing my mind. Wish somebody would tell me I'm fine. Everything was fun. It wasn't until like later is when it started to get dark. When I first heard the lyrics, I really didn't know that they were about a friend of ours. Something was terribly wrong with Mark. That was Mark's room right there, see up there? It was frightening, to be honest, for a few days here. This is my last resort. That's where I saw my friend. That was the thing that I loved about music was that you could tell any story that you wanted to tell. What's up, man? Good to see you, dude. And this was the story we chose to tell. Cut my life into pieces. This is my last resort. Right! All right, here we are, Energy Studios right here. Come on in to the live room. It's, I guess probably been almost 20 years since I've been in this room. Damn. This is where we did it, in fast in its entirety right here in this space. This place was the beginning of my life changing dramatically. I have my music stand right here and I'm just cutting vocals, just going crazy. There was a lot of blood, sweat and tears that we put into this project and you know, it was time for us to get in there and like throw it down, prove it. You've been dreaming about this moment your whole life and now it's here. Music was just an escape for me, you know, and being a, a you know, young kid with some madness in my mind, it was a great way to just kind of go somewhere else. Early years was pretty shifty and all over the place, you know, just my family was going through a lot of upheaval and my parents had split up when I was younger and my family was really, really poor. So when I was born, they were, my family was homeless. You know, finally landed in a town called Vacaville, California. We are headed from Sacramento over to Vacaville, back to the main stomping grounds of Pete Roach. A lot of great memories here, man. I had a lot of my firsts in this town. I can take you to where I lost my virginity. Nah, that'd be weird. Ah! Now we're pulling up on Vacaville High School. All four of the founding members of Papa Roach, we all met in Vacaville. This is where it started. I met Kobe on the football field at football practice in high school. He's like, I play bass, you know what I mean? Like, I play drums, you know? It's like, dude, let's like start a band, we'll jam. And he's like, cool, man. Pretty soon after that, his bass was stolen. And so he's like, "What? how are we gonna start a band? I don't have a bass. And I'm like, dude, just sing, it's free. After that, I was really just like, all right, cool. I, we need a guitar player. That's when we recruited Jerry. It was, 93, and they had been together, I think, a month. Jacoby called me up and said, hey, I heard you play guitar, you know, why don't you come and play with us? And I was just thinking, nah, I'm good. I just hounded him. Dude, you gotta come check it out, man. He's like, I don't know if it'll fit, dude. And I'm like, man, fuck it, dude. Like, what do you got to lose? I just said, fine, just to shut him up. Okay, I'll come over. Thank God Jerry was willing to show up to band practice one day and see if he could save these group of ratchet ass motherfuckers because we, did, we didn't have it figured out before we had him. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Our bass player, Tobin. Jacoby was actually in band. They were like seniors and I was a freshman, so I'm like the young one. 14 years old, playing this three-quarter scale pearl bass, but he just slapped this bass like a madman. At the age of 13, known in that local scene to be a badass bass player. Tobin, you wanna come play bass for the band? Been in the band ever since. 
we were looking for a band name and we had written a bunch of names down. And out of all the names, like there was one suggestion I had about naming the band Papagato. And which was like Daddy Cat, you know? And I was like, that's kind of cool. He came back at me like, what about Papa Roach? And he was like, but that's like your grandpa's name. I was like, I know, but it's kind of cool, right? The only thing was they spelled their last name with a T, so R-O-A-T-C-H. And I was like, what if we took the T out? And then, you know, it could be about like bugs or it could be about the little Mary Jane, at, you know, angle, you know what I mean? Like, you know, double meanings, it's cool. Kind of using the cockroach as like our mascot in a sense of like, it could just go through hell and still survive. You know, as a kid that kind of went through the ringer, I identified with that, you know, like I kind of been through some shit, man, like this fits. And there we were, Papa Roach. I remember one day we were at uh, Tobin's house. He would always play piano. I just would sit there for hours and come up with little, simple little things. I, I kind of figured out, okay, so the right hand will be like the riff on the guitar, and my left hand will do a bass thing. He had this idea, he comes to me, he's like, Dave, check out this, this thing I was writing on the piano. And he sits down behind the keys and starts playing this arpeggio. Dave and I just looked at each other like, holy shit, dude. felt so good, you know, to have something that I was really excited to show the rest of the guys. It was a very inspiring piece of music, you know, to say the least. Last resort. <laughs> Let's see, is this in tune here? Almost. Jerry, who's our guitar player, transposed it onto electric guitar. <laughs> went from this kind of classical sounding thing, this hip hop thing, to definitely metal. That's how it sounds heavy. Kobe brought in the lyrics and melody. It was actually a different song that we were working on. Cut my life into pieces. I've reached my last resort. Suffoc the lyrics and whatever weren't working on that song, so he, he's like, I'm gonna try them on this song. Little did I know, this song that Jacoby had these lyrics for, like they were about our friend Mark. Here we are, dude. And this brings back memories. At this point, you know, as a songwriter and as a lyricist, I'm really trying to like dig in to the dark corners of my, my life and my feelings. This is crazy. I ended up moving out when I was 17, ended up moving in with another friend of mine, Mark Parham. That was Mark's room right there, see up there? Right there, that pitch, that's Mark's room. We really bonded as friends and like we clung to each other and we helped each other out and we cooked for each other and we, you know, it was, it was, a, it was like our little two dude family, you know, and like we were just doing it. At this time, you know, started dabbling in some drugs. It wasn't like a regular thing, but we we tried it and uh, it really brought up some deeply suppressed issues in both of us. This night, it was either mushrooms or acid. I just remember something was terribly wrong with Mark. Mark's in his room and he's talking gibberish and mumbling. It was like three or four days, you know, I'm looking at my friend going, I can't even fucking, I don't even know how to help you. Like, I don't even know what to say. I don't know what to do. It was fucking frightening, to be honest, for a few days here. You know, we knew he, he struggled with some of his feelings and whatnot, and you know, his family, he'd been through some heavy shit in his life, you know? He had some trauma maybe he had been holding down, brought it all to the surface, and through this suicidal downward spiral, he was hospitalized, and it was like I just never had my friend back. It was like a, like a bomb kind of exploded in a sense. The old Mark died and there was a new Mark that was reborn. And I just didn't understand how to like relate to the new Mark. So we kind of went different on different paths. And I felt so guilty for bringing the drug, you know, bringing the drugs into the scene. Um, in the process of writing, that was one of the things that was sitting there, you know, waiting for me to like write about. 
and I wasn't singing it in a first person's point of view so I could like all of a sudden be the victim and get attention. That wasn't what this was about. It was just about telling the story. People were really taken aback and surprised at like how direct the messaging was in the song. I'm contemplating suicide. Don't give a fuck if I cut my arm bleeding. At first I kind of was taken back like, ooh, do we want to put that in there? That's kind of crazy. Like, but you know, he, Jacoby was just going, look, man, this is like, this really happened. The only way for him to really deal with it was to write it down and, and put it into song and kind of just get it out. And as soon as we heard that, like it was, it was game on. This one goes out to Mark Parham, my boy, my brother. It just was one of those tracks that we knew we had something that was just raw, authentic, real, and needed to be heard. This is the stage. This is where it all started right here, man. It's, it trips me out. I just got to look at it for a minute. Playing Last Resort in this building for some of the first times. This is where we saw the, the connection and the excitement with the people like really falling into that song with us real audiences started coming. Like, it wasn't just our group of friends. It was like other kids from around town, and we started packing the house. You know, 400 kids, 600 kids, 800 kids to the Vacaville Community Center. And once we started doing that, we're like, let's see if we can get a, a gig playing clubs. We started playing more and more of these club shows. San Francisco, Sacramento, Berkeley, Bay Area. Slowly gaining some traction and, and getting some attention and then putting out independent EPs. When larger bands would come through the area and play, if we didn't have a show book that night, we would go to their show and sling our CD to their fans. Jacoby would have a boom box on his shoulder playing our CD and he'd be like, what the fuck, Papa Roach, five bucks. What the fuck, Papa Roach, five bucks. We were sending our demo tape out to anyone and everyone, rock labels, metal labels, pop labels, and we were just getting rejection left and right. Every major label had passed. You know, they had heard our music. Nope, not feeling it. As different groups of people told us no, like it was like fuel for the fire for us. We just kept going and finally got a record deal and then it just, it all changed, like dramatically. Absolutely. Take you guys on a little journey. This is something really cool right here. This is a, uh, it's got dust all over it. This is a uh, old 24 track tape. So this is 99. This was the demo that got us the demo deal with Warner Brothers. Finally, we get a bite from Warner Brothers, man. Jeffrey Weiss at Warner Brothers. He was like, I think I could do something with you guys. I would like to offer you guys a demo deal, which basically means they give you a budget to go into a real studio, and then they decide if they want to sign you after. Basically going from somebody's home studio to one of the nicest studios in LA. We couldn't believe it. Like, we thought, like, this is it. You know, we made it. That was how we met Jay Baumgartner, and he owned NRG, and he ran it. The first time I heard Last Resort, the lyric, it's so sort of raw, and I was like, oh, this is really cool. So many people just don't want to talk about real shit. I knew it was special. I didn't know how special. Uh, Yo. What's up? Hey, good to see you, man. Good to see you. Oh my God. I came in yesterday and took a walk around the room, and I hadn't been in here in quite some time. And it's just all the memories flood back. When I first met Papa Roach, they had been very popular in Northern California, but they hadn't really done any seriously good recordings. You know, coming into the big Hollywood studio, like a fish out of water in a sense. And he challenged us a bit more than we thought he was going to. For me, it was like, I didn't want to change anything. I remember right. you were like, let's, yeah, just, yeah. let's just change like the tempo of, a, of the chorus. I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> fuck you trying to change our band. I would change like technical things, yeah. but I never wanted to change what you guys were about is, yeah. you know what I mean? No, absolutely not. Yeah. He knew how to work with us. He knew how to get under my skin and push me to a point without breaking me, you know? Lie! 
<laughs> that's brutal that is savage <laughs> god that's a really incredible vocal i mean that whole thing you know it's, it's like thank you that was a really cool feeling to have you know somebody in the industry that's believing in us there was a lot that we learned working with jay as far as arrangement song structure these types of things that we really didn't have experience with before <laughs> there we go. so there's the there's the main riff and then you add Jay has great ears, and we got the best tones, really great mixes. And then we had this thing, too. Oh, there we go. That's really all the production was, those three, the three That's tones. That's wild. You know? So it's just the straight-ahead guitar tone. It's that crunchy, nasty one underneath, and then the high yeah. one. so all those Get things. Don't give a fuck if I get my It's simple. It's simple. It's so simple. <laughs> and the place hasn't changed one bit. Still got the same carpet. Yeah. <laughs> that shit needs to be, ugh. Oh, we're putting a new carpet next week. <laughs> you so. better put, that's probably got some hepatitis in it or something, I don't know. Yeah. It's got the itis. Right when it was finished, I had done like a rough mix and sort of turned that into Warner Brothers. And the uh, the A&R guy there got fired. And then they they turned, they, they, they passed on Pop Roach. When we got the rejection letter from Warner Brothers, like we're, our souls were crushed. Dude, this is, it's just over, man. We keep trying and trying. We just keep running into these roadblocks and it was just really kind of a defeating moment. They were really upset. They thought, oh man, it's over. And I was like, you guys don't understand. Like, you're great. It's not gonna be a problem. I remember looking at the band just going, you know what, like, fuck it, like, fine. If they passed on it, or if this guy got fired, like, we're just gonna put it out independently. We'll go down to NRG, we'll finish up with Jay, we'll finish up like a full length record. I think we just had that hustler spirit, like no matter what, we're like, that's all right, we're just gonna keep going and something else will come along. And pretty much immediately, we got a call from, uh, from DreamWorks. This guy named Ron Handler from DreamWorks had caught wind that Warner Brothers had passed on it. When I heard about the Warners thing, it was just shocking that something so good was just like, let go for the person across the street to take, <laughs> you know? Ron Handler came down and heard the demo and was just fucking blown away. He didn't show it to our faces there. He was like, you know, just vibing on it. That started a whole new experience for us. I got the CD, I met the band, we got the contracts going, and next thing you know, I think we were back in the studio to make the record. There wasn't anything that was gonna stop them. If this label passed and, and my label passed, somebody would have got him eventually. You know, it was just like undeniable. We thought we were gonna get a record deal with Warner Brothers, but we ended up getting the deal with DreamWorks, which changed our lives. I remember when we started talking about it being a single. There was a moment of hesitation for this song to be the single after we heard the radio edit version of the song. Don't keep up my yard. Do you even care if I... I was just like, how many words are you gonna chop out of the song? It wasn't just the cuss words, they started taking other stuff. I couldn't say the word suicide. And we're just like, fuck that, you know? This is what the song is. It's stupid, I mean, when you look back on it, especially now, when you listen to music now, you're like, really? Right when Last Resort was starting to crack off the hinges, we got the call to jump on Warp Tour. We were originally added to the second stage in the middle of the day, and on the very first show in Fresno, so many people came to see our set that day that they broke the barricade. So literally the next day, they upgraded us to the main stage. And then our single went to the radio and it shot up being played everywhere and we were losing our minds. And the next thing you know, we're like headlining Warp Tour in like a matter of like weeks. You know, when we released this record, our whole entire hopes and dreams was that maybe we could sell 100,000 records like in our wildest dreams. So the first week the album dropped, we sold 30,000 records. The next week after that, like the numbers just kept like doubling and tripling. And it just went, mm, 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 mm. It was like unbelievable, I couldn't believe it. You know, I just never ex had anything that fast and powerful with that kind of like upwards momentum. 
Yeah, I think I think Infa sold uh, five million at least. Once that video came out and the song came out, it was you couldn't not hear it. Going from like this band that's in a van, really good at budgeting our band fund and saving a certain amount for gas money and saving a certain amount for food to all of a sudden we're traveling all over the US and buses and limousines and private jets and penthouses and all this like stuff that was just totally foreign to us. We went from being unknowns to being known by the entire world, like literally overnight. I wasn't ready for that. Fucking bananas, man. Everything was fun. Everything was fun and funny, and it wasn't until like later after success and everything had gone on when, is when it started to get dark. You know, you go from just having like living this amazing life, and then when it slows down and everything's quiet and you have to deal with everything that you ignored for so long, yeah, that's when that voice in your head just is knocking at your door. <laughs> you know, this rock and roll thing kind of, I really gave myself to it, and it it didn't give me back what I necessarily always wanted. You know what I mean? Jacoby is very open about who he is and, and the struggles that he has in his life. It's been a wild ride for me, man. The, the, the battle with alcohol, I just came to a point where it's just rock bottom. Fast forward to some years later, my grandfather committed suicide because he had Lou Gehrig's disease. And I was just like, I fell apart. It sucks, dude. Suicide is fucking terrible. You know, I had found myself years later in my own struggle with suicide and being suicidal. It was a really, really, really tough time in my own life. I'm going, is it fucking, is, it, it's like, is my life just a fucking parody? I'm a joke on me now? Like, what the fuck? You know, like, because I was really at a deep, dark place. And this didn't have to do with my grandfather or Mark. This had to do with my own issues and the things that I had been burying for years. In half a mile, turn left onto Hume Way. Hey. Yo, what up, Marcus Cobe? Hey. Hey, are, are we cool to come through now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, man, well, I'll see you in a little bit. It's crazy how the relationship with the song had changed from being about my best friend, Mark, then to being about, you know, my papa's suicide, then to ultimately to my own struggle with suicide. You know, I was like, whew, heavy shit, man. All right, so here we are. Here we are. Ha ah, ha ha, what's up, man? Yee! Bandito, dude, good to see you. Can we, what are we doing? Are we pounding? Good to yeah, see you, dude. See you too. How you been, I'm man? Good, I'm good. Dude, right? give me a damn hug, dude. Come here, man. So, I get this phone call. And he's like, hey, uh, I just wanted to pass something by you. You know, we, we kind of wrote this song. And I just kind of want to make sure it's OK with you if, and whatnot. I, and I just kind of thought to myself, it, it's your music. It's your song. I, who am I to tell you what not to feel or think with regard to this stuff? So I'm just like, whatever. So, but I always thought to myself when you did that, I thought, that's awesome. That was really respectful, really Great. kind on your part. And so I do, I do appreciate that. Hey man, well yeah. you know it's like, I just kind of walking through that period of time in your life with you, like, and it was it was really you know it was really it was just hard it was hard to see you struggle yeah. and it was like a traumatic it was a traumatic experience for right. me you know yeah. like I think even though I experienced uh, you know a breakdown and what I dealt with it was harder for me to watch my friends watch that happen right yeah you're sitting there watching the situation occur and I just there's nothing help. you can do yeah i just I mean, felt helpless. helpless i just saw right? you struggle totally unequipped yeah. to deal with that circumstance yeah you know as i as i look back i feel like fuck not that it was my fault in a sense but just i was bringing that influence in yeah you know we, what i mean we, i let it in too though yeah you know what i mean like so i right. don't no one ever I don't look and go, I blame you. Sometimes I look back on this song and I go like, was it good that we, that we wrote this song and we were like tackling this really heavy issue? I wrestle with it a little bit, you know? To be honest with you, I hated that I was a bad influence on you. In a sense that I had this space available, you know, my-, my But you weren't, bro, that's not- No, I that's understand not that. What it, what it, I understand what it, that. Yeah, I what understand it, that. What it, what it was. Yeah. 
at all. But, it, like, but, but just that's, that's funny how of... we both walked away feeling the same yeah. way. Oh. Yeah. Last resort is it's a conversation. It's a conversation that people are willing to have more and more. It's opened up a dialogue for some of these people to like really put themselves out there and let the people around them know that they're struggling. I think that's what's really special about the song and, and the way that it's stood the test of time. Every song is a snapshot of where you are as a band or as a person, as a lyric writer. But then the same song later on down the road can take on a whole different meaning and a whole different relevance to what's happening in your life then. What he wrote was about the experience of crying out for help. It's not a song about suicide, right? Because I'm still here. Yeah. Right? And it's not about that. It's about the response. How do you help someone who's in crisis? How does a person in crisis respond to their own crisis? The story of Last Resort to me is a story of struggle. It's about falling into the darkness. It's about finding your way out. And especially with what happened here at this house and what the song was inspired from, it's, you know, it's about life. It's about, it's about coming through the other side. And I've met thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people out there on the road and that's the story I hear from people, is that this song was, was, a, was a beacon of light in some darkness. And that's, that's awesome.